and welcome to the latest of our coach Q&A sessions. Tonight we have the senior coach of the Leinster rugby team, Stuart Lancaster, who's going to do a short presentation for us about some of his own thoughts on coaching and coach development. And we'll follow up then after about 20, 25 minutes or so with a number of the questions that you guys would have submitted. Um, and myself and Stuart be working on some of those earlier today. So um, for everyone's attention, you can see on the right hand side, there's a speech bubble with an arrow or with a question mark in it. And that allows you to submit any questions or make any comments that you might want to, to make during the, the course of the session. So if you've anything to, to, to say or, or any points you want to make, just make a, Q, uh, a comment to that, to that Q&A session over there. So Stuart, it's over to you and, and you can work away and take as long as you need. Okay, thanks Peter. Uh, hello everyone uh, from Leeds. Um, uh, yeah, we're currently doing it tough over here in the UK, but I uh, hope everyone's safe and well over in Ireland and wherever you've tuned in from. Uh, so when uh, Peter originally um, approached me about doing this, the original plan was just do a Q&A on the back of the um, talk I did um, at Croke Park a couple of years ago, but obviously aware that not everyone would have been there. So I decided to um, give you some thoughts on coaching um, and then uh, have the questions at the end. So as Peter said, feel free to, to send them in. Um, so here's the format. Uh, I'm going to talk. I was going to do just top coaching tips to start with, but then I actually did uh, a rugby course uh, to AIL coaches in Ireland uh, last week. And I talked about some of the principles of rugby. It was a rugby, it was a rugby educational course. Um, but the more I thought about the Gaelic sports of football and hurling, and the, obviously the more I've watched, the more I've begun to think about the principles of invasion games being similar anyway. You know, my background's a teaching background. So um, when I'm playing basketball, I'm coaching hockey, coaching basketball, coaching soccer, um, rugby, etc. A lot of the principles are very similar. So I'm going to start off with those um, tips. Uh, the ones that I think are relevant, particularly to, to your sports. Uh, and then the second part of the presentation is about actual coaching tips. Um, the point I made when I was at Croke Park was, listen, I appreciate we, we all don't do this full time. I'm very privileged, very lucky to do it full time. But my background uh, as a rugby player was when the game was amateur in England. So it was the 90s, the game went professional in 95. So a lot of my formative years in the sport were Tuesday, Thursday, play Saturday. Um, and uh, as I transitioned from playing into coaching, my coaching background was also Tuesday, Thursday, play Saturday. So I understand your world um, uh, and how, how that works. So I've tried to make it relevant um, uh, for you guys out there. Uh, I'll send the keys phase out to Peter. Um, the purpose is really to generate ideas and get you thinking about your coaching. Um, we've had some great questions already. If there's any more come in, you know, obviously send them in. Um, and then final point, I mean, if you can send it through to Peter, that'd be great because it is, I've, did the, I've been doing this last week in um, the AAL Rugby One. Um, I'm literally in a room speaking to a screen. So normally when you speak to an audience, you can get some gauge of um, feedback in terms of body, body language or whatever. So very hard to get any feedback when you're looking at the screen, but uh, um, please provide some. OK, so key points for you to think about, I think, from the start. And I always start with this for any coaching um, organisation, any team, really. Um, there is no right or wrong way to win games. Um, there's no right or wrong way to win rugby games. We could have four different teams in semi-finals and all four teams could play differently and all four teams on any given day could win. And the key thing you're going to need to coach in is to have decided on what your way is for your team. And that's ultimately what players want. Players want clarity on what you believe in. Um, but it's not just having um, uh, uh, an idea of what you believe in. You've really narrowed it down, you've got it clear in your mind. And you thought clearly about what's your on-field philosophy. That is the way you want to play the game. Um, you know, in terms of your tactics and your um, attack structures, your defense structures, and your off-field philosophy in terms of the way in which you want to build your team. So the values, the behaviors, um, the vision of what you want to achieve off the field. I think both are equally important. A lot of coaches make the mistake of not doing one or the other, um, and uh, it leaves them struggling once the season started to navigate a path through um, uh, through the season. So this is the Bible, Bill Walsh, the school take care of itself. I should be on some sort of commission for this book because Seth Rowe got promoted. And this is his, his 
one of the golden nuggets out of this book is his um, idea of what your philosophy is. So an aggregate of your attitudes towards fundamental matters. So fundamental matters being um, the fundamental matters that affect your team's performance, both in attack, defence um, and off the field and derived from consciously thinking about critical issues and developing rational reasons. So critical issues. So critically, how do I want to set my team up to defend? Critically, how do I want to coach my team? Critically, how do I use my support staff? These are all critical issues. And the reason I'm going to do this is because um, I believe this is the way we should be doing it. Um, and that's why we're going to hold this position over another. So what the players want ultimately from us as coaches is clarity of direction uh, and a vision for the future. And I think and if you haven't done that to start with, then you're really going to struggle um, as the season goes on. So this is, like I say, the eight tips I would give from a rugby perspective. But like I say, see if there's any crossover into, into hurling and football and, and tell me what you think at the end. So what I'm trying to achieve with Leinster um, is two things um, in, in the first, first point. I'm always trying to explain to the players why we are trying to do things. Um, so we're trying to develop their understanding of the game and I'm trying to get them to um, fundamentally understand why we attack the way we attack, we defend the way we, we defend, the tr we train the way we train. And that's no different if I'm coaching Leinster's senior team and my son, who's now 18, I coached when he was under sixes. So I'm coaching Leinster's under sixes or my son's under sevens team or, or my daughter's team. She played uh, lots of different sports, um, trying to explain to them to the team, to the young people, why are we doing this? OK, I think if you can explain that, then you've got more chance of success. And ultimately, we want to develop in our sport for lens to be successful, multi-skilled players who can play in different positions. And I think um, we often in rugby pitch no players into narrow brackets. We're selling to a, a failure, really. One of Leinster's success is the fact that we've got players who can play different positions um, and who can adapt and do different skills. So that's number one. The second thing in rugby is we need a phase play code. So we need some way of building our attack in the unstructured elements of the game. Um, so I need to develop that with my team and I need to be able to coach good passing um, skills in order to achieve that. And when I think about hurling and football, I think of the same thing. You know, I look at teams and I think, you know, I'm, I should be able to see a pattern of how a team is building their attack um, or defending. And obviously the accuracy of the passing skills in your sports is is critical. If you develop those that phase play code and you develop the passing skills, that will help them read an excuse in phase play um, and that improves mental quickness and alertness. Because fundamentally what we're trying to do at Leinster is to be one step ahead of the opposition. So we know what's going to happen before it's going to happen. We're, we're going to attack one sided defence before they've even realised we're even, we're even coming. So that anticipation and the mental quickness and alertness is key. You know, a quote I gave to the players is, you know, we don't want to be the driver that falls asleep at the wheel where, you know, you're driving along, you're not quite concentrating, there's no real clarity of where you're going. Um, you're looking at your map or you're looking, <laughs> looking at your sat nav, it's foggy, there's no direction, so you drive slowly and you can't um, see where you're going. So we're, not, we're always trying to improve that anticipation. So in rugby, um, in order to create tries, we need to create good width in our attack. And when I watch soccer, as an example, or my daughter's hockey team, um, uh, I'm watching, I'm thinking, geez, why don't they play with more width? If they play with more width, surely the spaces between defenders would open up. And the same is true in rugby. If you create good width in your attack um, and get good alignment in shape, then um, we have a better chance of stretching defences, playing through the defensive line and creating try scoring opportunities. Obviously, you're aiming for a target, we're aiming for a line. Um, but the critical thing in order to achieve that is to um, avoid ball following. Now, when you're coaching young kids, um, I remember coaching my son's team, it was like bees around a honeypot. They're all running around following the ball and trying to get them to understand how to hold good width and good shape. It's still an issue that with the eye of the seniors sometimes, because what a lot of often players do is they follow the ball with their eyes or they physically follow the ball. Um, and what we want to do is to help the players to understand that if we create good width in our basketball game, our hockey game, our hurling game, our football game, then we're going to have a better chance of causing problems for the defence. And we must be able to stand and see the picture. And the best players I've coached, and um, Johnny Sexton would be the best example, really. Um, he takes so many pictures within the game. He's, uh, he's got a real clarity over what's coming next. He's two steps ahead, not one step ahead. And there's a little clip here I want to show, which is Frank Lampard. 
um, when he was playing for Chelsea. And watch how many times he scans before he receives the ball. He's taking a picture. I reckon a dozen times there before he's actually got the ball. And if you read his um, autobiography, when his dad was coaching him as a kid, he would just say, pictures, 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 take a picture. And, and Frank obviously developed that skill um, as, he, as he grew up. And if we can develop that scanning and the ability to see vision in our young players, then I think we'll have better players at the, at the end point. Key thing in rugby is um, to, to score tries, and you know, we're fortunate to score a lot, um, is because we work very hard on the speed and quality of our alignment in attack. And we very much see it as a foot race between can we be set before the defence? So the urgency, speed and quality of alignment is critical for attacking success. Quality setups give the attack options. So, um, and we, we there's a lot of transition, obviously, in, in your sport, sports, and um, there is in rugby as well. So we play a lot of games in training that have a transitional element where we've got to go from defence to attack and how quickly can we get set and beat the defence in that transition period. Five focusing on basics. So um, this lad um, on, on the picture here is Kieran Frawley. So it's a scary lad. He's come through the club system and he's someone who's 21, 22 years old now. Um, and he's broken into our European squad. Um, and he has really, really worked hard on his space and the basics of the game. Um, he's a quiet lad, um, but he's learned how to lead the team. He's fly half. Um, so he, he sits in you know, illustrious company at, Le at Leinster. Um, he's developed his understanding of the game. He understands where the space is. He's beginning to see that better. He can he can see space and affect the space with accurate kicking game. So he sees the kick space as well. Um, and he hope really works hard. So, you know, he's a real um, beacon really for our academy and the club system and players who can be coached, who, who want to be coached, um, who can come through and play at the highest level. Again, one of our success factors, I think, is our ability to play at, our, at top speed. And the reason we can play at top speed is because we train at top speed. And I'm going to come on to the training principles um, a little bit later. But if we have um, a Tuesday session, for example, and it's 40 minutes of rugby, the players are attuned to know that when we train, we're going to be training flat out. We coach technique outside of that 40 minute window. So the technique of passing, the technique of catching, the technique of line running, the technique of tackling, the technique of um, throwing in and a lineup, the technique of goal kicking, the technique of the rook, it's all done outside of that window. Because what I don't want to do in that 40 minutes is slow down the pace of training so we don't get the intensity, the mental challenge, the physical challenge, the conditioning effect and the speed. And often I would say our sessions are over speed. I would say they are, well, they're definitely quicker than, than the game. The game of rugby often is a stop start affair sometimes, you know, scrum collapses, this, that, and the other. We don't get any of that in training. You know, we play at top speed and we challenge any team we play to play at our pace. And I'm, I'm going to show one rugby union clip um, and I'm not sure how relevant it is to, to your sports, but I suspect it is because if you've got players who can be the extra man, then ultimately um, you're going to have a better chance of scoring more points and winning games than the opposition. So your work rate off the ball is what defines Leinster, I think, and how we work to achieve that success. So here's Gary Ringrose here scoring a try. Um, and the clip I want to show you is Gary Ringrose um, playing uh, for Ireland uh, recently. So hopefully you can see this. Just turn that sound off. OK, so there's Gary. So Gary's just approaching this breakdown here. So he's on the uh, um, the right hand side of this, this rook. So there he is. You can just see him now. He's got 13 on his back. He's getting up to move now. There he is, just behind the referee. He's got up from that rook and he's worked. See him working out the back. And there he is creating the opportunity. So my point is, if you have players who can, if you're playing an 11 side game, 15 side game, 12 side game, nine side game, seven side game, if you've got players who are prepared to work harder than the opposition, 
and be the extra man, then you've got a better chance of being successful. And finally, obviously, without stating the obvious, um, the key to success is having players who can make good decisions under pressure. And the only way you can develop good decision making is making sure your training sessions have decision making in them. So our training sessions at Leinster are 90% games based, um, where players are asked to make different decisions depending on the parameters that are set within the game. Um, and I'll change the parameters, the width of the pitch, the size of the pitch, the number of the attackers, the number of the defenders, depending on the outcome I want. Um, so in order for us to be successful in rugby, um, and I assume it's the same in yours, is we need to handle uh, under pressure, we need to attack the gain line, um, so we wouldn't play deep, we'd play uh, flat and we'd attack hard. Um, we need accuracy and precision of our pass, pass passes need to be in front of the receiver, and we need to have accurate and effective running lines, and that's the type of things we build our, our game on. We need world-class execution in core positional skills. So obviously we've got different players, forwards and backs who play different positions. Speed of alignment and realignment is critical. We work hard on our communication, our on-field communication um, and our off-field communication in meetings. Um, so players learn to grow their voice. And ultimately you can have all those things, but if you don't coach them well and you don't use your training sessions well, then fundamentally I think um, you'll struggle. So the second part here, so I'll just go for about another 10 minutes. So we understand what to coach. I'm sure it's, you've got lots of different things in your sport that, that you would coach. Question is, how, how do we coach you? How do we become better coaches? So here are my top 15 tips. Um, develop your understanding of the game in as many areas as possible. Be a complete student of the game. Study the game, don't just watch the game. So there'll be many times we'll turn up on a Monday and let's say Ireland have played Scotland at the weekend and I'll say to the players, so what do you think of the game? And they go, well, you know, Ireland, you know, deserved to win. Okay, tell me how Scotland defended. And they'll go, um, not too sure how oh, Scotland defended. I wasn't really watching that. Okay, tell me the fundamental ways in which Ireland broke down um, Scotland's defence. Um, can't really remember, you know, and this is players who are in a professional game. So what I'm trying to encourage them to do is to be a student of the game and to study the game and to learn the game. Now, I'm still learning the game now and I've played it since I was 10 years old and I'm 50 years old now, so it's 40 years. Um, but I've come to Leinster and I've learned. I've learned from the players, I've learned from the coaches they used to have, I've learned from the coaches that who were there. We've got Felipe from Argentina, we've got Robin from Wales, Leo, obviously. Um, and I try and study as many games as possible. So Southern Hemisphere games, international games, um, be a student of the game. When you are in my position as a, as a teacher who became a coach, you get taught how to teach. Um, you get taught about different coaching styles. You get taught how to plan sessions. You get taught how to organize sessions, how you position yourself in training sessions, how you explain drills and games. When do you explain drills and games? When to demonstrate, how to demonstrate, how to vary the tone and pitch of your voice. Um, how frequently to communicate. So the things I would, I would ask you on this point to think about is there is no right or wrong coaching style. The best coaches pick the right box, tool out the box at the right time. So sometimes you'll be directive, you'll be telling them. And one of the key things we, what's happening in rugby union is that we sometimes go down this empowering approach to young player development. Now I get the importance of empowering coaching style, um, but I think in, in a younger age, I think direction and clarity and quality of coaching is key as well, um, in fact more so. So I'd be reasonably directive um, with the younger age group and I would vary my style um, as I uh, progressed, progressed them through. That's not to say I wouldn't want them to get have a point of view or to develop their communication skills or their decision making, um, uh, but I want to make sure I'm varying my coaching style depending on the group I'm coaching and the session itself. Planning, so all my planning takes place the night before, not the day of the session. Often, particularly, you know, I remember I was coaching Tuesday nights, I'd be finishing teaching, jumping in my car, driving to training, writing down a bit of paper what I was going to coach. You know, I wasn't really doing the players, a, um, I was doing players a disservice really. Um, and then all that planning could go out the window because there's only four balls there and one of them's not blown up, or someone's forgot to ring the cones, or there's not enough bibs and I can't split the teams up. That is infuriating for me as a coach. So if no one else is going to organise it, I'm going to take responsibility. And you know, I know it doesn't cost money's tight and everything else, but 
I'd make sure I've got enough balls, enough cones, and enough boots for my session. Everything else I can I can deal with. But but organization is key. Where you position yourself, your explanation, if it's pouring with rain on a Tuesday night, maybe you explain your drills and your session and your content in the change room. Um, maybe you do your demonstrations in there. Um, but ultimately it's your enthusiasm as a coach that, that sets the tone for the session. Um, and the players will often um, bounce on your on your personality. With your session content, I think one of the things I try and get the balance right is between variety um, or repetition. So we repeat certain things, we repeat the passing skills, we repeat running lines, we repeat the movement patterns that happen in a game. So we repeat that on a weekly basis, but every week there's a tweak to um, the session. So we're not going to do the same session day in, day out, week in, week out. Um, so there is variety. Um, I last week we played double touch. This time we're going to play offload touch, or uh, this time we're going to play a defensive game. Um, but all I'm trying to do is rep the movement patterns that occur in the game. I'm also trying to rep the technical skills that occur in the game as well within the session content. And I plan it way in advance, but then I'll tweak near the time, and sometimes I'll tweak within the session. One of the things I find with players who become coaches is they often only ever coach what they were coached. If that makes sense. Um, and a lot of them have, have got um, I don't know, three or four games that they play, three or four drills, and that's it. And when you're coaching a team that sometimes, well, like in rugby's um, situation, your pre-season starts in July, you've got right way through to the end of September. So that's three sessions a week, four sessions a week um, for eight to 10 weeks. Then the season starts in September, you go September through to June. So you're talking 40 odd weeks a year, four sessions a week, you know, you have to have variety in your locker. Um, and how do you generate that? Well, I write down good drills and skills that I, um, and games that I see. Um, I sit and I think about which ones I can do and I can do, uh, I can tweak um, and I come up with new games. And sometimes they don't work and sometimes they're not brilliant, but, but ultimately I'm trying to make it varied, but with repetition, if that makes sense. And I want to make it game related. So there's a big push in England um, in rugby where we played like, different games and you know invasion games and we could pass the ball in any directions but we can't pass the ball forward in rugby we can only pass it backwards so a lot of the time you know I thought I think we need to make it related to the actual game that we're playing don't be too creative um, in rugby we have a big debate about structured and unstructured rugby so structured being the set piece and the starter plays the unstructured being um, obviously the 80 percent of the game and some coaches would have the philosophy that we would um, maybe split that 50-50, um, but I would probably be 80-20 in favour of unstructured. And obviously, having watched football and hurling, I'd say it's probably even more so than that. Now, maybe I'm reading the game wrong, but it looks like 95% unstructured to me. So therefore, your training has to have that, that balance. Um, and that point about technique and gameplay in your training week, um, try and generate windows, even if you're only training Tuesday or Thursday, where you do your technique outside of the big body of the rugby, con uh, sorry, the, 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 the training content. Um, because you want your session to have intensity. There was this coach I coached with once and he would, um, uh, he'd coach, he'd start the game going and then he'd stop, right, I just want to make a point. And he'd talk for five minutes and then there'd be a question, there'd be this, there'd be that. And suddenly you're looking at the clock and thinking, this session's taken an hour and a half and there's been no intensity whatsoever. You know, give me 40 minutes flat out with me shooting corrections at players and one minute water break and a quick chat and let's go again any day of the week. Um, let's say you've trained on Tuesday and you've trained a specific um, strategy or a technique for the upcoming game at the weekend. You need to check if the players remember that on Thursday. You need to check the learning is I guarantee you 95% of the time if you say to the players on Thursday, what did we do Tuesday and why did we do it? 90% 90, 90 of them will go, I can't remember what day, what we did yesterday. Um, so you've got to create memory recall um, by asking them um, questions about the past in order to hardwire the techniques and skills that you're trying to build into them for the future. Um, I think it's really important. You know, we often turn up to meetings on a Tuesday, having trained Monday, and my, the players know it now. First going to say, so what did we do yesterday? And why did we do it? And then I'm just trying to get them to remember because I want that hardwired into the minds for the weekend game. Create good habits. If you create good habits with your repetition and the variety in your training, you'll have a talent, talent will shine.
Now, habits they acquire at training are a vital part of game intelligence and result success. Now, I would say this because I'm a coach, but um, I believe it's the quality of the coaching that you do in the week that leads to the performance of the weekend. Now, players, obviously, you need high quality players if you're going to win at the highest level, and players obviously have a fundamental part to play as well. But fundamentally, I think good coaching can improve teams. Um, good coaching can give the players a better level of game understanding. Good coaching can give the players the enthusiasm to want to play the game and pursue excellence. Habits are created with repetition and variety in your approach with immediate correction. Okay, we've talked about that point. If your train is too repetitive, your game will become too predictable. So Leo and I had this conversation today and we were talking about the DNA of certain teams. And he said to me, what would Leinster's DNA be? And I, I said, well, I hope from I hope people think it's adaptable. I, we can win the game in different ways, number one. And number two, I hope people struggle to define our game because I don't want us to be easy to predict. There are a lot of teams out there in rugby who are very, very good teams, but you can know exactly what they're going to do, which means that defensively it becomes easy to set up your defence to defend against them. Now, you don't need to be um, hugely charismatic to be a coach, but you have to have the power in your personality to create a hard wiring. So you've got to think about not just what you say, but how you say it when you drop your voice, when you bring them to your attention, when you want their, when you want their, their, their attention, um, how, you, how you sublimely get inside their heads. They have a little inner voice in the head when the game's going on, it's your voice. Um, inner voice talking, not outer voice shouting. So shout on the sideline, you know, for me, it's a waste of time on game day. In fact, I would say very, very little on game day, but you want to listen to a Monday, Tuesday, I am flat, flat out, okay? Right alongside the players in the training session, coaching in the moment, trying to put my personality across to them. So we coach our decision-making through constant game-based training with reviews. Now I'm lucky in that we can get our training sessions reviewed. We can review the, um, the content on the Tuesday. We can look at Monday's training and, and review why did we do it? What, did, what happened? Why did this go well? Why didn't that go well? I would say 90% of our learning comes from reviewing training rather than reviewing games. Obviously, we learn a lot from reviewing games, um, but a lot of our hard wiring comes from training and reviewing that training session. Now, I know obviously for you guys, it's maybe not possible or practical. Um, if there's any way you could engineer it, I would definitely try and do it. Um, and the second thing is we don't give up part of the training session to get fit. We use the training session to create fitness. And I think um, that is done through the games that we play. So training sessions on a Tuesday are tough, physically tough, running up and down the pitch, attacking, defending, transition. Um, but as a consequence, you know, it's got to be a lot better than running up and down without the ball. That's my mindset anyway. And certainly the players, I think, would agree, would agree with that. Last two then, relentless pursue further knowledge to improve. Um, so I think, um, obviously, you know, what you guys are doing tonight, I don't know how many people are on, but there's a lot, I think, which is fantastic that you all want to improve and get better. Um, there's so much content out there, less so on coaching, I think. I think if, if we could wave a magic wand, I think we could have a, uh, an online coaching club um, to discuss ideas. There's lots of stuff on leadership and communication. Um, and obviously there's the game itself and how you can improve um, uh, your game knowledge. So um, particularly in this window we've got at the moment, you know, let's really try and accelerate our development as coaches. And ultimately try and create a team that has a freedom to play and enjoy the sport. You know, ultimately as coaches, we're there to inspire young people um, to play the sport and to create um, camaraderie, teammates, team spirit, resilience from winning and losing, fitness, you know, you name it. That's why team sports, you know, like, like the ones I coach, like the ones you're involved in, um, are the lifeblood of communities. And, you know, that's why I think we all feel at the moment um, a bit lost without without it. Um, so hopefully it'll all be, hopefully we'll all be back there soon. So listen, I'm going to pause there. I'm going to try and find my way out of this um, and uh, hand back to Peter, who hopefully should have some questions somehow. You there, Peter? Yeah, George, I'm here. Okay, I'm just going to try and change the screen. I'm going to say, so it'll, it'll, my, it'll, my, all my detail, I don't mind. It'll just be yourself on the screen, okay? okay. So you have yeah. nothing embarrassing behind you on the wall or anything? And I'm all good. <laughs> okay. 
Well, we've gotten a lot of questions and just for people's information, we have 1,001 people coming on the call. Wow. Um, awesome. So it, it's fantastic. So a lot, we've got a huge number of questions. So what, we, what we've tried to do is try to divide up the questions, some of which are more coaching related and might uh, Stuart might have referenced some of the answers already, but we, we'll cover some stuff that maybe he hasn't. And then some that are leadership related. And then maybe a couple of questions at the end towards maybe what you see as, as some things for the future for us. Yeah. So if we're OK, we, we might just get started. We go for about 25 minutes or so. OK. Um, Stuart, who would you say has been your biggest influence as a coach? Can I get five? <laughs> Is that fair? Yep. OK, absolutely. There's two. There's two. That um, who have passed away now, who are American coaches, who don't even know I existed. But um, uh, if there was two coaches to study from American sport, I would pick Bill Walsh, which is the book I gave. Um, or, and he built the San Francisco 49ers dynasty. Um, and the second one is John Wooden, the UCLA basketball coach. Um, now, the more I've read about John Wooden, the more I've read his books, the more I've realized that my philosophy as a coach is very, very similar to his. And they built a dynasty. Um, so he'd be of that mindset. I mean, the book, it's Wooden on Leadership. Actually, both both books um, are written by the same author, Craig Jameson. Um, so I'd really recommend both. Um, and so those two coaches um, from America, and then three people um, from the UK, um, a guy called Brian Ashton, who was actually coaching in Ireland for a bit. He was my, um, uh, he was in charge of the academies when I was a young academy manager coming up. So when I was transitioning from school teacher to coach, um, he had a big influence on my philosophy and the way I saw the game. And he he coined the frame freedom, freedom with responsibility. So a lot of his philosophy on the attacking game is in, is ingrained in me. And um, there's a guy called Kevin Barron, who's a Welshman who coached Wales um, maybe 10 or 15 years before I coached England. And he was head coach development for the RFU. So I'm a big believer in doing coaching courses. You know, coaching courses open windows for me and doors that I never would have opened. Um, so things like um, making connections with people, learning on, on courses um, and being directed by someone like Kevin as to where to go and when to do it. He would be a big, big influence. And then the third um, is a mentor, really, who is a guy called Bill Bezik, who's a sports psychologist who worked with Steve McLaren, actually, um, various times. Middlesbrough, he worked with Alex Ferguson at Man United, um, worked with England football. And he uh, was a basketball coach as well, actually, funny enough. Um, but he was a very, very good mentor to me as I was a young coach making the transition from academy coaching into senior coaching when I was in my um, mid thirties. Okay, got this. Uh, five was, was more than we could have uh, banked for. Um, interesting, you mentioned John Wooden. In a couple of weeks' time, we have Professor Wade Gilbert speaking on one of these sessions. And um, when I met Wade a number of years ago, he told me that that when Wade was a little bit younger, he met and worked with John Wooden before he passed away. So. Oh, well. Um, well, yeah, Wade, yeah, Wade will be giving some insight there as well. Um, a couple of other small things on coaching. Um, how important do you think the the context of the of, of who coaches are working with, the different types of players, whether they are teenagers or female athletes, um, and and what are you, what are your own experiences of those, and how is your approach different? So say again, Peter. Just so. What's the question? So, the con do so in the con say when you're working with hey, when you're working with different uh, groups of players, maybe a teenage group or, or child group or, or 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 maybe a female group. Has your has your coaching changed or your attitude changed or has your changed? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was the, the reception's going, on, but um, um, hopefully you can hear. Can no, you hear me? Can you hear me? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear. You. Yeah. Can yes, you hear we me? can hear you. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think definitely, definitely the style and yeah, the. We can hear you. So. Yeah, the, st the style and the content um, of my sessions would change depending on the age group. Um, so if I, you know, I'm going back to being a PE teacher, um, you know, I would use a lot of differentiation. When you coach at a professional level, the st skill level and the standard of the players is very, very similar. When you're coaching at younger age groups um, in rugby, for example, um, you you have a very 
different skill level and often you have very big physical differences as well, particularly when you're coaching, you know, in those teenage years. So how you differentiate um, and how you create challenge for everyone is important. Um, one of the things I did at DCU actually was talk about the relative age effects. So sometimes, particularly in younger kids, you know, the early maturers, the early uh, birthdays tend to dominate sessions. So how can you create sessions that allow everyone to get a fair chance? Because, you know, our sport rugby is definitely a late specialization sport. So I've got to find ways to keep those people who need to physically develop um, engaged in the sport. So how I differentiate is, is important. Um, when I'm coaching um, girls, um, again, I actually find girls are um, far more receptive than boys sometimes to coach because they're they're keen to learn. Um, and you know, I did a lot of um, mixed teaching when I was a teacher um, and single sex teaching as well as uh, girls and boys. Um, and I found the girls fantastic to coach because they were very, very receptive and open to to listen and learn. Well, sometimes the lads think they have all the answers to be honest. But uh, so yeah, there is definitely a change between coaching age grade um, players and and senior professionals. Um, and I think that how you think about differentiating your session to make sure everyone gets a fair crack and the and probably the more physically dominated dominated players don't dominate the session, I think is key. OK, when you when you reflect back on your coaching journey, um, are there times when you think back and think, well, I didn't do that particularly well, and, and what say to yourself now about that? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, a lot. Um, I think probably the two, the two times that stand out really um, were, so I, took, I went from the academy manager's job in Leeds to the director of rugby job, quite a young age, 35, um, and we got promoted in the premiership. And I got involved a lot in the off-field management and recruitment of the squad, um, selection decisions, board meetings, you know, stuff right at the top of the uh, of the organisation. Um, and I was spending less and less time on the coaching field and I was delegating to my assistant coaches, which is great. They were great coaches and they've gone on to be great coaches. Um, but I remember one of my best mates came up to me and said, I'm watching your team play. It doesn't look like a Stuart Lancaster team. And I was like, he's right, you know. Um, and I drifted away from coaching into management. Um, and if I'm being honest, um, the same happened with England in, in over the course of the four years. Um, obviously, international coaching is different. You've only got 10 games a year or whatever. Um, but I, it was such a big job and I don't regret the foundations and everything I tried to do with the team. Um, but again, I remember finishing the England job thinking, um, what's my passion? My passion is coaching. I was very, very lucky that Leo came in and offered me a role where effectively I can operate at Leinster, you know, with a free license to coach and support Leo um, on leadership development. Um, and and, Deli and Leo and Guy and, and the people at the top end of Lens will do a lot of the managerial responsibility. So that's the big learning for me. You know, one is follow your passion, which for me is coaching uh, and leadership. And two, make sure when you are proportion the times of your job between leadership, coaching and management, you get the proportion right that suit your skill set. That's not to say some people might want to be better managers um, and, and less coaching and, and delegate more. That's fine. But for me, you know, I want the proportions to be higher on coaching and leadership and less on management. Thanks, Stuart. We move on to some of the leadership questions. So, what? I didn't get you there, Peter. Okay. Uh, we we'll try it again. Yeah. Um, for some of the leadership questions that came in. Yeah. What do you think makes a great sporting leader? Great sporting leader. So I think um, clarity of vision, I think is key um, to be a great sporting leader. Um, so you must have a clear vision of where you're gonna go. Someone said to me once that leadership is like having a telescope and a microscope at the same time. So you got you can see the future, um, but you can see the detail as well. Um, I think um, leadership leaders don't necessarily need to be um, inspirational all the time, but they need to be inspiring. So they need to um, have a point of view um, and they need to be able to inspire the people that they lead. Um, I think leaders must have high credibility. Uh, I think credibility is built on technical excellence, um, on honesty, on integrity, um, on good communication, 
And probably the most fundamental key tenant of a successful leader is doing what you say you're going to do. Now, it sounds such a simple thing, but so many leaders I've worked with or seen in the past where they promise one thing and do another, or they say they're going to return a call and they don't, or I'll get back to you and they don't. Um, and, you know, to be a good leader, you need to be inspiring, technical excellence, honest, forward thinking and planning. Do what you say you're going to do. Do you have any particular um, strategies for using with, with quieter groups of uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the lads that coach at Leinster are pretty quiet, to be honest. You know, if I was, we do, we use insights as, uh, as a psychometric, um, which is a, like a personality profile. And a lot of them would be on the blue green side, which is more towards the introverted side than the extrovert. Um, so one of the first things that struck me when I came to Leinster was how quiet the group were. So, you know, there were exceptions in there and they were the natural leaders. So Johnny, Sean O'Brien, etc. They were very, very good in meetings. But the rest of them are very, very quiet. Um, and what I've tried to do since I've been at Leinster is grow um, the self-awareness of the group and of the individuals as to the importance of communication. Because in a sport like rugby, and it's the same in hurling and football, the coach isn't on the field. It's not American football where the coach calls the players. The players have to own it and live it themselves. And in order to do that, you have to be able to communicate both in meetings and on the training field uh, and on the playing field. So. Um, Number one, I identify the importance of communication. I'll give examples of where poor communication has let us down. Two, I expect the players to come in with a point of view. Three, every player in that team meeting must be prepared to speak in that meeting. Now, that's down to me to create a cultural container that's solid enough. So if a young player wants to speak, he can speak without being ridiculed by the seniors. You know, I've been in hierarchical teams where, you know, the seniors do all the talking and young players don't say anything. Then the seniors retire and no one's got a voice because no one's had a chance to develop it. So we we get the players to find the voice, we talk about the importance of it, and we allow the young players to, to help contribute to that. Um, and um, we guide them through that process of becoming more self-aware and becoming aware of the team's personality to generate a more vocal, physically and verbally um, effective team. A number of coaches have asked about developing their own leadership style um, and, and talk about raising their own self-awareness. Yeah. Um, have you any tips or advice for coaches on how to do that? Well, I think the first thing to understand is that leadership is a skill that can be learned. You know, I think it's not this sort of like things been bestowed, bestowed on like, you know, the chosen few. It's a skill um, in the same way that you would learn any trade, you know, leadership can be learned. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The first step is to develop self-awareness to understand your own personality um, and you can do that by getting feedback or just reflecting on how you deal with certain situations. Um, the second is to develop um, an understanding of um, social awareness, so your ability to read mood um, and and the third then once you've got those sort of things clear in your mind is to actually go and study it, go and study leadership. Um, I've put loads of stuff on LinkedIn um, which is leadership related from things I've learned is from, from leaders um, and people just need to send me a connection and start reading some of that, you know, podcasts, um, books on leadership, you know, some great books out there. Um, any books on emotional intelligence would be good. Um, leadership Challenge is a very good book. Um, Language of Leaders by Kevin Murray, very good. Communicate to Inspire by Kevin Murray is very good. Um, John Gordon, The Power of Positive Leadership is very good. Um, Martin Newman, uh, his book is called Emotional Capitalists. Um, very, very good at book on leadership. Um, so, and these are these are heavy duty like theses on leadership and like really academic books to read. They're simple books to read, and they'll really resonate. Hopefully, coaches out there where you can, I can actually improve to be a better leader. So I know I'm a better leader now than I was ten years ago. I'd like to think in 10 years time, I'm going to be a better leader than I am now um, because I'm constantly trying to learn um, from the best. Um, I'm constantly um, reflecting on my own leadership decision making. So every time I finish a meeting, I think, you know, how did I, how did I present that? How did I deliver? Could I have handled that situation better? Um, so reflection of, on my leadership and also really critical is getting some feedback on your leadership. Uh, in, a, in a positive and constructive way. So I remember once I did a, 
uh, a questionnaire to the playing group and it was to reflect on my six, on six leadership styles. So directive, um, coaching, um, affiliative, so creating close emotional bonds, pace setting, um, autocratic, um, empowering, I think it was. Anyway, whatever the six were, and I had to rate myself how I thought it was, and then they rated me. Uh, and um, it was funny because, uh, you know, I was, there's me saying, I'm not that pace setting as a coach, and they're like, geez, you are. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's not necessarily strength all the time, pace setting, you know, so you don't want to be sending emails at half five in the morning to everyone because everyone's thinking, oh my God, give me a break, you know, so. It's picking the right tool out of the box at the right time. Same with the, same with the coaching styles. Um, with regards to players and groups within your environment, then um, are you a fan of leadership groups? Uh, and if if so, or if not, maybe you might expand on that. Uh, yeah, no, I think leadership groups are really important. So having a leadership group that, you know, we've got sixty-five players in Leinster, forty-five senior players, and twenty academy. Um, and it's virtually impossible, it is impossible to communicate effectively and accurately with all those players on an individual basis. Obviously, the key to leadership is creating those connections with every player, but you often need some critical decisions decided by a group of um, maybe five, eight, seven, eight, ten players at the most um, who can then be the representatives of the group. And often these leadership groups are the best when they have a mixture of ages and personalities and experience within there rather than just saying right it's the eighth most senior now there's lots of ways i've seen teams go about um selecting these sometimes it's player led or player voted or some really good books um in american uh, sorry australia um any given team i think it's called um which they go about um uh, voting voting for for leadership groups um in leinster we it varies a lot because we've got a lot of players who are often in and out of the team through international rugby. So probably half the time our top and most senior players are away with Ireland. So, you know, we have 17 players in the Ireland squad, which is a huge chunk. Um, so we have, a, we have a mixture of senior international players, but also players who aren't going to play international rugby. Um, so like Scott Fardy would be a good example. Um, he's come from Australia. Um, uh, he'd be in our leadership group. And that leadership group at Leinster has been um, selected by Leo really. We obviously speak about as coaches um, and um, uh, but also the players um, had, had a vote this time as well. Um, so two years ago last year um, it was it was done by Leo really um, and supported by us as coaches and this year the players had a, a, had a point of view on it as well um, which was great really. Um, but the whole premise behind the leadership group was based on the values of the team. So you have a vision for where you're going. So, you know, Lens's vision, you know, is to, is to obviously be the best club team in the world, really. Um, but but equally, um, um, we have a sort of underlying vision behind that about driving the legacy together. But we have three um, values that we base the team around. And then we have behaviours that sit underneath those three values. And then we decide the leadership group on which players most represent the three values that the players have come up with in the first instance. So that's how we went about it. But I think they are important is, is the long answer. Really um, short answer to the long, but a long answer, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and you spoke about values and, and behaviours there. Um, have you tips for, for people on trying to build that culture within the within a club or a group? Yeah, I think I think this is an area of guided discovery, I think, depending on the age of the group and depending on um, the seniority in the group. So say uh, a, a younger, a younger, a younger team, like if you're coaching an age grade team, 16, 17, 18 years old, sometimes they're not quite mature enough or quite, don't have a quite understanding of teams to, to really give them the whole responsibility for deciding everything, the behaviours. In fact, I had an email from a coach today saying that very same thing, saying, you know, we tried to go down this route with our under 18 team of get them to decide the values of behaviours, but it didn't really work because everyone had different ideas and they couldn't really hold each other to account. So, you know, sometimes maybe as a younger, with a younger group, you do be slightly more, you'd guide them a bit more, a bit more directive um, and help them. Um, with a senior group, obviously it's easier for them, I think, because they've got the experience of um, what the team's about and what they want to achieve. We use someone externally to help in that process, which helped, I think, uh, you know, it's a different voice from the coaching team. Um, and I think um, it was really beneficial because it wasn't, Leo's values and Leo's behaviours. 
it was the players. It was the players who came up with them and they ultimately hold each other to account and we can hold them account to it. In fact, I read an article um, yesterday about um, a coach, Sean McVay, um, who's at the LA Rams, I think, a uh, young, very young American football coach. And he said that, um, and the players were giving feedback and said, he is tough, 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 you know, but all he's doing is holding us accountable to the standards that we set ourselves, that we expect of ourselves. So we don't dislike him for being tough. We actually respect him because he's holding him to the values that we've created. And I think that's a really good balance to achieve between a coaching team, a leadership team and a head coach. Um, every time you've mentioned a book or a, a coach or an author in the last hour or so, uh, the number of questions coming in for from everybody to, to repeat those books, repeat those questions um, is huge. Um, so we might say to everybody, we circle in all the, the list of recommended readings that, that Stuart has um, after the session. Yeah, well, 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 if there were two these earning materials that you've had during your career, what, what would you found, have found the best? Two, two materials? Two or three books or other learning materials. Oh my God, I've narrowed it down to two. <laughs> um, uh, you have a tough audience. Uh, I'd definitely got the Bill Walsh one um, and the John Wooden. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't move away from those two. Um, they, they uh, are excellent, really. Um, I've, I've got hundreds, hundreds of books. But what I'll do is, if I, um, uh, I'll, rather than people trying to write them all down now while I'm talking, if the line's not great or whatever, um, I'll give you the notes. Um, Peter of the slides anyway, and I'll do a link like a, you know, a top 10 if you like reading list. Um, uh, all, all, and like I say, you just reiterate the point, all the stuff that I've learned really, I share on LinkedIn and I also have a leadership course on Udemy. And um, so U-D-E-M-Y. Um, now, uh, Udemy does such good discounts, you could probably buy it for five quid and uh, um, it would keep you going for 30 hours. So, uh, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not rocket science, the course. In fact, it's probably, that is, maybe that's the strength of it. It's very simple in layman's terms, but um, there's a lot of stuff on there on emotional intelligence and um, leadership styles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, we've, I've had about, I don't know, 1,500 people around the world sign up to it, which is amazing, really, you know. Um, so it's, it, it's out there if people are interested. Thanks, Stuart. And yes, we, we'll, we'll publicise all those for people afterwards. Um, we, we'll finish up with a couple of questions. And this one came in from one of the uh, participants tonight, and it's anonymous, so I don't have the name, but it's been intriguing me. What's <laughs> the best advice you've been given, and what's the best advice you've ignored that you wish you hadn't? Oh, the, the best advice I've been given. That was the first question, yes? Yes, that's it. Um, be yourself. Um, uh, I don't try and copy, you know, I'm Stuart Lancaster, you know, I wouldn't try and be Jose Mourinho, Alex Ferguson, you know, Joe Schmidt, Wayne Smith, you know, be yourself. Um, people can see through um, leaders who try to be something that they're not. Um, now, you're never going to um, get everything right all the time. And I, I put this on LinkedIn, I said this idea of credibility. So if you imagine credibility is a graph and you've got naught at the bottom, zero credibility and 100 is the most credible person. Um, and you enter depending on your experience uh, and the level which you've coached maybe beforehand. So let's say you enter at 20, you're a young coach and you do your first team meeting and you've painted a clear vision for the future and you've articulated it, you've done a good training session and in the mind's eye of the players, you are on 22 points out of 100. You've gone, you've gained two points. And then you do the same thing again on the Thursday, and then you get a good intervention on Saturday. And you get, uh, you deal with a win or a loss in an effective way. It's only on 25, 26 points. But then you make a mistake and you don't coach the session as well, but you put your hand up. You say, listen, I didn't coach that that well. You might lose a couple of points, but the trick is to gain more points than you're losing. Um, and I think um, you can only ever do that if, you, if you're yourself. Um, and you gradually, you'll be, if you stick to the principles of honest, inspiring, forward thinking and planning, technical excellence, do what you say you're going to do, 
you'll get more points than you lose. And and people respect for who you are, not because who you're trying to be. That's the key thing. Um, second question, Peter, was what the 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 advice I ignored that wish I hadn't. Yes. Um, so it probably came after the event, actually. So I met um, a guy called Jim Collins. Jim Collins wrote the leadership book, Good to Great. Um, he talks about level five leadership in his book. Um, now he's, a, he's a legendary American leadership expert. He's also a rock climber, interestingly. Anyway, he lives in Denver, Colorado, and we had our training camp pre-World Cup um, uh, in Denver, Colorado. And out of, I read his book and I thought, well, I'll take a punt and maybe try and meet Jim Collins. And uh, so I emailed his office, said we're here, and he didn't know what rugby was really, never mind you know, who I was. By the way, I managed to engineer a, a meeting with his number two, and I got to the number two, and he said, oh, Jim's got half an hour. So anyway, I managed to get in front of the legend, really. And anyway, three hours later, I left and spoke to his staff and created a great relationship and rapport. Anyway, he followed my career um, afterwards, and he saw what happened in the World Cup, and he saw, you know, I was out of work, and uh, he sent me um, uh, an email, and he said, there's always another mountain to climb, Stuart. This is his rock climbing analogy. There's always another mountain to climb, and I was like, you know, he said, "Would you, if you'd like a Skype call, let's have a let's have a call to catch up." So I then arranged this call with him, and you know, we had a good chat about it. And he'd mentored Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. Steve Jobs got sacked from Apple twelve years prior to going back there to obviously make it the company it became. And he said to me, and I wish you'd told me this. I wish you'd told me this before the World Cup or before you know um, everything unfolded. He said, "I said, well, why did?" What happened to Steve Jobs after he'd lost that job at Apple? And he said he went away and he thought to himself, what is his passion? What is my passion? And his passion was designing Apple products and creating great you know, phones or whatever else. And he went away in that period after, after getting sacked and he found his passion in again. And, you know, I wish I had consistently followed my passion and not been drawn into managerial roles that Ultimately, I could do because, you know, I'm reasonably organized and everything else, but it took me away from my passion. So um, no one gave me that advice beforehand, so it's probably not the right answer, but I hope you get the point I'm making, you know, um, follow your passion. If your passion is coaching and helping individuals get better in building teams, then um, do it, do it, because it's a brilliant profession to be in. It's a, it's a roller coaster ride. Um, you know, I feel like I'm still on a roller coaster, to be honest, but um, and I sometimes ask myself why, why I do it, but I genuinely love it. The connections you make with players, um, the experiences that you have, the moments in the change rooms after games. Um, you know, I have an academy player I coached, I don't know, 20 years ago, contact me today. I see players I've coached become coaches, you know, and uh, it's, it's such a rewarding profession. Thanks, Stuart. You've been so good with your time uh, all the last week or so, and especially this evening. We will finish up. If that's okay, um, I suppose it's related to the current sort of cessation of activities that we have across so many. But for you, what have you learned in the last month or so during COVID-19? How are you and your teams into the future? Um, it re yeah, I mean, it's it's a great period for reflection, isn't it? And um, I, I, I was out of work from leaving England to joining Leinster, and that was nine months. Um, and every day I had to get up and find a purpose. Um, and, you know, I travelled a bit and I thought about my what happened in the World Cup and how I could get better and, you know, wanted and waited for that another opportunity. It feels very similar now. I feel like I'm in that, that period where, you know, Jim Collins actually talked about it. He says, you go on a leadership journey and you go on this tremendous period of growth and then you plateau a bit. And the plateau bit is where you do all your learning and all your reflection and then you go up again and you, and you, you move on to the next level. And I think we're all in that plateau and I think we should take the most of it to to you know, obviously protect ourselves and our families and everything else, but also connect perhaps with our families. You know, I'm conscious of being on the road for years and years and years. Um, I think the virtual connections has been a brilliant, you know, um, thing to come out of this. And I'm des you know, I'm trying to keep my connections with those Leinster players. So, you know, I go back to the inner voice talking um, that I'm still inside the head, so that when we meet again, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later, you know, we can pick up where we left off. Um, but we're all better. You know, there's no reason why we can't get better in, even in this window. Stuart, thank you so much for your time. Um, on behalf of the 1001 
the <laughs> people that were on on this call. Um, I wanted to say really, really thanks and really, really appreciate it. Um, we've been running this series now for about three and a half weeks, and, and this has certainly been one of the highlights that we're going to look back on very, very fondly. Um, to everybody listening, all of the materials that, that Stuart spoke about, we'll have all of these available back on the GA Learning website. Um, and also, it's possible now to register for this Thursday's event. So for those of you that have been uh, regular viewers of these sessions, we have sessions every Tuesday and every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Dublin time. Um, next Thursday's session is uh, by Dr. Damien Young, who's with Satanta College. Um, and the details of that session and how to register are all available on the J Learning site from now. So thanks very much to everybody for coming on the call. We really appreciate you guys giving up your time. We hope you and your families all stay safe and well um, and, and that we're all back on our training and playing pitches very, very soon. So thanks to everybody. Well done.